Episode 324, March 15th, 2018. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the G-Talk Show with G-Mama, Josh, and Tony. So sit back, strap in, and And brace brace yourself. yourself. Hey, Josh, you know, this thing, the Amazon Echo, have you heard about it? I think Tony seems to be a little obsessive and crazy about it. (laughs) Yeah, Tammy, I've heard about that. I actually have one. And, uh, well, no news here. Tony's crazy about a lot of things. (laughs) All right, Tony, what's up with this Amazon Echo? And please... This time, keep in mind, it's a Jeep podcast. Yeah, yeah. Well, Josh, I'm glad you asked me about that. The Amazon Echo, Alexa, has added our little show to their big selection of skills. That means that everyone can now listen to our show on their Amazon Echo. Alexa, ask the Jeep Talk Show to play the latest episode. Welcome. You can listen to all the episodes of Jeep Talk Show, a Jeep podcast, including new episodes as they are released. For now, you'll start with the most recent episode, but you can change by skipping forward or backward. You can even say how many episodes you'd like to skip. The newest episode is EP.323, New Wrangler Just Got More Expensive. Would you like to listen to it? Yes. Here's EP.323, New Wrangler Just Got More Expensive. Episode 323, March 8th, 2018. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? Alexa, stop. Okay, come back anytime to listen to your podcast. You just have to say, Alexa, resume. Wow, that's really cool. Now, are all our episodes on this Alexa thing? They are, Tammy. And how do I add the Jeep Talk Show to my Echo? Well, just go to the Amazon Echo app on your phone, select Skills, uh, then search for the Jeep Talk Show. When you see us pop up, tap on the Jeep Talk Show, then click on the big enabled button. Seems pretty simple, guys. It's really simple and lots of fun. I'm really excited about it. Even crazy. Local Jeep news, national Jeep news, and news from around the world. It's This Week in Jeep. This Week in Jeep is brought to you by Amazon.com. I bet you're sitting there wondering, how is it possible that we're able to bring you hundreds of Jeep talk show episodes all for free? Well, it's with support from Jeepers just like you. The next time you go shopping online, consider using Amazon. But be sure to click the link on our website first or just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash Amazon and we'll get a small kickback from your purchase no matter how big or small it is. Once again, that's jeeptalkshow.com slash Amazon. And thanks in advance. Well, here's a a little something different for all of us Jeep lovers out there. In early March 2018, Mahindra Automotive North America launched the Roxor, a side-by-side two-seater off-road vehicle. The Roxor is small, and it has no windshield or safety equipment, so it's not street legal. It's made strictly for off-road fun. And what could possibly be more fun than bouncing out of a moving vehicle with bugs in your teeth? I can't think of a single thing. Mahindra is the Mumbai, India-based brand that focuses on industrial and power sports vehicles and has little name recognition here in the United States. So why should any of us care? And what does Roxer have to do with Jeep exactly anyways? Well, Mahindra got its start in 1947 manufacturing military vehicles under a license from Willys. They were simple, rugged, and purpose-built vehicles that took soldiers wherever they needed to go, no matter the roads or lack thereof. Here's another way of putting it. In the early days of Jeep, the vehicles were built under license by a number of different companies, and Mahindra was just one of the first to get on it, way back in 1947. Today, the Jeep is currently owned by Fiat Chrysler Automotive. But prior to that, thanks to various mergers and acquisitions, we all know that the Jeep name has been owned by Willys, Kaiser, American Motors, Renault, Chrysler, Daimler, and the Cerebus Group. Mahindra has maintained agreements with all of those companies to build licensed Jeep copies since 1947. Now it's building its first one here in the United States, the Roxor. Now, the Roxor was designed specifically for the U.S. market, but it's based on the Mahindra Thar, which is a Jeep that Mahindra builds under license for Asian markets. 
It's industrial grade construction with steel body on a box steel frame, makes it stronger than competing vehicles and more like an old school Jeep than anything on the road today. Now, specifically, it bears a strong resemblance to a CJ7. The power is sourced from Mahindra's industrial offerings, a turbo diesel four cylinder engine paired to a five speed manual transmission. Now, it's not super powerful. It's going to yield you about 62 horsepower and a top speed of 45 miles per hour. But again, you're not allowed to drive this on the road. So Mahindra plans to build out a network of 300 dealers across the nation and is considering other vehicles as well, including a postal truck, if the Roxer is a success. Now, the Roxer starts at just $15,499 and will be customizable with a range of off-roading and work-oriented dealer accessories. Check this out. Well, be sure to go check out the links on our on our website for this episode. So looking at some of the specs uh, uh, that you were talking about here, I don't see yeah. this as being a uh, con- competitor to, like, say, the uh, Polaris, uh, the Razor, those those side-by-sides, those uh, those things that can do upwards of uh, 100 miles an hour in the, in the dunes. This is going to be a little bit more utilitarian, and the name is also going to kind of give away a little bit of what it was designed for, rocks, rocks or. This isn't going to be something that you're going to be doing 70 miles an hour across the sand in. This is going to be something that where if you need to go, you know, redo that fence on the back 40, you hop in this instead of hopping on the quad. Maybe you hop in this to, you know, go have some off-road fun on the trails, maybe pull your snowmobiles up to the top of the hill, you know, that sort of stuff. Again, this isn't what I would call the ultimate off-road rig, but this certainly does give you a good starting point for, you know, a little bit of fun for an off-road only vehicle. Be pretty cool on the golf course too, right? (laughs) Yeah, and now we're talking. (laughs) Well, some people choose to park their Jeeps in garages. Others may opt for the carport, or may they just maybe leave it in the driveway. However, the owner of a green-colored Jeep Wrangler decided the best place to park their Jeep was in the Waianea, the, the Waianea, the, the, easy for me to say, river in Kauai. What is likely the result of a single vehicle crash has left many residents completely puzzled. Last Saturday, police responded to a report of a vehicle that was fully submerged in the river on the east of the, 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 that one river, Twin Bridges. <laughs> According to a preliminary investigation, police say the driver possibly struck the bridge and at some point reversed into the river. The driver then fled the scene. A nearby resident was reported to have heard the crash and went to go investigate. Police said the resident went to the scene and observed the newer model Jeep Wrangler underwater with its headlights still on. Now, thinking the worst, the resident jumped into the river to ostensibly rescue the occupants, only to discover the vehicle was empty. Police have since contacted the vehicle's owner to remove the Jeep from the river and to ask the question on everybody's mind, just what the F happened? As of yesterday, Wednesday afternoon, the Jeep is still in the water and we still don't know how exactly it got there. The headlights have since given out and we're sure there's going to be a bit of a musty smell in there for the next owner. The investigation is ongoing. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Monty High. Um, Okay. (laughs) <laughs> call, uh, I, I, think call it, I think it's a, I think it's a Wainaha wa, 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 I, I don't know I'm sure if, if we have any Kauai residents uh, <laughs> listen to this right now I'm sure they're just screaming into their phones right now yeah I know <laughs> that's great though well unlike by the proper pronunciation of a river in Kauai uh, this should be coming any day now after months and months of speculation and rumors, we may finally have a slightly less muddy picture as to whether or not Jeep will be coming out with a subcompact model of SUVs. Now, speaking to reporters at the Geneva Motor Show this week, Jeep Global boss Mike Manley talked about the possibility of Jeep releasing a new SUV, smaller than the Renegade. Quote, I have to say that one has moved on reasonably significantly, he said. You will probably have to wait until our big event in June when we talk about the next five years to see if it's officially in the plan or not. Now, Jeep and FCA have been toying around for years with the idea of a truly compact SUV. Since the Renegade is one of the largest small SUVs on the market at just over 167 inches long, there is space for an even smaller compact option in the Jeep lineup. Now, while the Renegade is quite small for an American 4x4 already, In Europe and other parts of the world, a compact American 4x4 would likely do pretty well. Now, the Sub Renegade would be based on the FCA Mini platform, not to be confused with Mini Cooper, that the Fiat Panda and the 500 are based on. Now, unfortunately for the U.S. market, this new Ultra Mini Jeep 
would most likely be built at the FCA Pomigliano plant near Naples, Italy, where the, where the Panda is produced. At the Geneva Motor Show, Mike Manley also announced the launch of the Wrangler plug-in hybrid in Europe and potentially Australia. Big news, certainly in the works at the FCA Jeep Camp. We'll, of course, have all the latest on this and other Jeep news each and every week, so make sure you guys stay tuned. So do you think it's possible to have a one-door SUV? Because it sounds like that's where they're going with this. I mean, I just, uh, just take the doors off. <laughs> we don't need doors. True. It could be like, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, gee, I'm, I'm brain farting. What was it? Uh, Fantasy Island. It'd be like Fantasy Island. All the vehicles had no doors and had a uh, an awning for a top. But, Here uh, we go. Uh, yeah, well, I guess there is that one French car that is like a three wheeler or something, and it has the, oh, the yeah, whole like front, open the whole nose. Yeah, the whole in, front yeah. comes off. <laughs> well, it'd be very interesting to see what they come up with. I'm I'm kind of curious because uh, that would be kind of cool. I mean, I I used to have Hot Wheels and Matchboxes back in the day, and uh, it sounds like that's what FCA is going for here. Yeah, really. I mean, <laughs> fit in your pocket. <laughs> well, in the meantime, folks, if you've got a news tip or you have a response to any one of our stories, be sure to let us know by phone or by email. Just head over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact to find out how. I got to say, Josh, I love these stories. Uh, great job on this. It's always fun to hear Thanks. what's in uh, this week in Jeep. And it'd be fun to hear me pronounce the name of a river. Oh, correctly. man, don't sweat it. That's that's good <laughs> podcasting. That's that's just good podcasting. Oh, that river. <laughs> Hey, uh, if you recall, Steve 4.3 LXJ started a new series on episode 320, Finding Trails. Uh, tonight, we continue this series with part two. It is, uh, well, more, more Finding Trails. This is Steve 4.3 LXJ with another Jeep tip. And I'd like to continue our series after a short hiatus on uh, Finding Jeep Trails. And the reason we had this little hiatus is because the uh, USGS gov website uh, gives us free maps that i use all the time but their map locator is down and as far as i can tell it's a russian hack that was designed to influence the election and until we have a congressional hearing it's all going to be blamed on jeepers and wanting their free maps to go wheel and all that stuff so and they've been working on it for a month and until they get the hearings over with we're stuck with it not working. But I want to take you there and show you how it works so that uh, when they do get it fixed, you can use it. So if you go to usgs.gov, it's a government website. And if you click on products and USGS store, you'll notice that there's a map that of the United States that comes up, a green and shaded green and white and so forth that it comes up and if you uh, uh, zoom in on it you find out that it's just one huge big topographic map of the United States and it the whole United States has been mapped topographically from cities to farmland to mountains uh, including Alaska and you can get these maps free but this map locator doesn't work so I went to an alternative source, and that is National Geographic, and that's natgeomaps.com. That's natgeomaps.com. They also have free topographic maps, and it's the same maps that they have uh, available from the USGS with an improvement, and we'll go over that later. So... When you bring that up, and, and you need to do this because uh, we're going to be looking at these maps, uh, put your cursor on trail maps, and you'll see that uh, a window there has uh, Trails Illustrated Topographic Map Guide and PDF Quads, free USGS quads. You want to click on that, uh, free USGS quads, and you will find that as you do so, you get what looks like the exact same map locator there as you scroll down a little ways looks like the exact same map locator that USGS had and as far as I'm concerned it is and so I want you to use this and download a map because we're going to be using this map as almost like a classroom and we're, we're going to show you how to find trails on these maps so looking at this map you look at california and look at the east side you'll see where the state line has a dog leg there you want to put that 
use your your mouse to put that in the center of the uh, window there and keep blowing that up and if it gets out of the the uh, window uh, move it back down and you'll see that Lake Tahoe is there and, and keep zooming in until you get a whole bunch of red dots that appear on the screen and as you look at Lake Tahoe there at about the middle of the lake on the left hand side go over to the second dot to the left and click on that and it should say Wentworth Springs click on the picture of the map and it will download the Wentworth Springs quadrangle and after you've done this uh, we're going to use this in our next podcast and show you how to use these maps to find places to wheel until then, we'll see you on the trail. I think Steve's working on the Jeep while he's uh, recording his uh, segment. <laughs> now that was pretty cool. It was very cool. But I, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking that all these trails are going to be west of the Mississippi. Could be, uh, but that's going to be kind of the fun part about finding out. Uh, grab those right. maps that uh, Steve was talking about. And let's follow along. I'm very interested in this. I, I really want to see if there's any in Texas. I remember taking a long trip uh, to West Texas, and I couldn't find anything that didn't have a fence around it. So uh, it was just kind of a, you know, go out and look type thing. So, uh, But I was really surprised. Anyway, so, you know, join us next week for part three of Finding Trails with Steve 4.3 LXJ. And, you know, coming up in Campfire Side Chat, Tammy's going to tell us about her finding uh, about her finding some trails in her area. She didn't really know that they existed. Oh, they were exciting. <laughs> You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Jeep Talk Show is a proud member of the 4x4 Radio Network. Just visit 4x4radionetwork.com and learn more about the 4x4 Podcast, Center Steer Podcast, Trail Chasers Podcast, and our newest member, the On the Trail Podcast. Yeah, guys, this is Tom from uh, Arizona. Just wanted to food for thought on uh, episode two, or 323 about your going in reverse to recover someone. The if you have a high pinion or low pinion, it changes whether you got reverse gear or standard rotation gears. So if you're not jerking hard or whatnot, or if you're just four wheeling yourself and you got reverse gears, you're on the coast side or vice versa, whichever it is. I don't remember right off the top of my head. So the argument about pulling backwards, eh, you can kind of go both ways. Yeah, is it advisable? Probably not. But you're not any necessarily weaker or stronger, depending if you have a high pinion, low pinion. If you don't know, you don't know. Also, on the gears, uh, 48s, pretty much Dana 30 is the highest they go. JK, they can go to a 513 and a 538 now. Yes, they are smaller, they spin a lot more, and they uh, can cause some problems, but I've been running them for a long time. Um, in the Dana 30 on my old Cherokee, um, and an old TJ. I've upgraded since to 44s. But uh, with a sensible right foot and whatnot, they uh, they can last and they can do good things. And uh, by the way, I have we have three Jeeps. One is white, one is chili pepper red, uh. and one is blue. So it's a 98 ZJ with a 360 Limited 5.9, a 98 TJ, and an, an 09 JK. Have a good one. Like the show. Uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> Where red, are my blue. black jeepers? I don't know. That's red, white, and blue. I can't. I can't fall <laughs> into that. He, he covers the bases there. That's <laughs> that's a way to go, Tom. And uh, and thanks for calling in. By the way, that's good. Good information. Red jeeps. Oh, shut up. <laughs> 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 Shut up and listen. Shut up. So shut up. You don't shut up. Shut up, Shane. Hey. (laughs) Shut up and listen. It's time for Wrangler Talk. It's time for G-Mama. So I don't know if you guys have been catching on to my theme. It's um, (laughs) the top five. Um, And so this week I'm going to talk about the top five personal items you should take with you when you go off road. These are items for yourself when you go off road or overlanding or just a day on the um, 
out in the gravel roads. Um, the first item I suggest are good shoes. And these are lightweight for your feet because you know you're going to have your foot on the pedal all day if you're going wheeling. And sometimes those big, heavy hiking boots just are a little too much. So I go for hiking shoes. And when I headed to Moab last year, I bought the Merrill hiking shoes, which were awesome because they were also when you get out of your Jeep to maybe check to see what line you want to pick or why you're stuck or the rock in front of you. Anyway, they're perfect when you get out of your Jeep to walk around those terrains. Um, the second thing would be a change of clothes because you never know when you're going to get muddy or you're going to come across some water that you might be, have to wait in for a rescue, somebody else or yourself. Um, the third item are water bottles or something to have um, your liquids in, your non-alcoholic liquids. And I like Jeep water bottles. Um, this is so you can stay hydrated out there on the trails and you may not think that this is something that you need because you're going to be sitting in your Jeep all day, but you do, it drains you, you get exhausted, and you need to keep hydrated to stay healthy while you're driving. Um, the other item would be, depending on the season, Tony, you probably won't need this first one, would be a knit hat. And this would be to keep your head warm um, when you're getting in and out of your Jeep on those cold, wintry days. And the, uh, or the other item, like in the summer or the spring, would be a baseball hat or some kind of hat to keep the sun off your face and out of your eyes. Now, this last item is, especially if you're heading out to Easter Jeep Safari here in a little bit or anytime you go wheeling. But when I went to Moab, this was something that I wish I would have had. And I did get it after the, um, the first day of wheeling, but it was chapstick. My lips were so raw from the elements out there and the wind and the sun and the dry. Um, so chapstick would be your fifth item. So those were my top five must-have personal items to take with you on the trail. And next week, I'm going to share my top five must-have Jeep accessories if you're a Jeep mom. These are very important accessories that you will need in your Jeep, especially if you carry your kids with you. Wow, knit hat! It's, you know yeah. you're lucky, Cami. You live in an area of the of the country where you can live and uh, live uh, wear a knit hat and not have people point and stare. Yeah, and of course, if you have a girl's foot, well, a light shoe is actually something that's possible when you have a size 14 like mine. Light shoe, uh, that's more like a yeah. Sandal. <laughs> I was thinking, you, you know, I don't really have a problem pushing on those pellet pedals. It's just, you know, it's I could do that all day long if that's all I had to do. Yeah, it's uh, my feet just get really, really tired in those big clunky boots. I bet. Yeah. So, hey, folks, coming up later in the show, you know who he is, Nikki G. <laughs> we certainly don't, do. If you don't, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll just tease this a little bit. Uh, Nikki G makes a comment about Super Croc. So hang in there, people. You want to oh, hear this. Boy. The gloves are coming off, people. <laughs> yep. It's a war. <laughs> So, uh, speaking of great things, so we had a, a great review, and I, I was really, uh, really liking this when I was reading this. It was uh, the re review came in a few days ago from Ed S. He gave us a five stars on our Facebook page. He says, "Wonderful podcast. I just listened to the interview with Brian Hutton and his Jeep Stomper episode one thirty ish." <laughs> Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, that's a long time ago. It just brought a tear to my eye hearing this heroic story about a man and his Jeep versus Mother Nature. And then he adds in a nice uh, hashtag Red Jeeps Rock. Well, thank you. Uh, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. What? What? You, you, you're not Tony, gonna, American your hero here. You're not going to. Put your glasses on and reread that hashtag. Yeah, Red Jeeps Rock. Orange Jeeps Rock. Is that orange? Uh, yeah, but you it's know so what? Close orange, to red. Is the, <laughs> orange is the new black. So oh, black Jeep's rock. There is no black <laughs> in orange. There is red in orange. But uh, if you guys don't recall, uh, Brian Hutton uh, and uh, Stomper, his Jeep was actually in the Moore, Oklahoma tornado, and he used his very heavily damaged Jeep to help uh, pull uh, objects and uh, things off of people, walls and stuff. 
horrific tornado there in Oklahoma, and he was right in the middle of it. And in that uh, great interview that, uh, well, I shouldn't say that since I did it, I, <laughs> Brian did a great job in letting us, giving us the feel of everything that was going on there. Uh, but Tammy says she's not going to listen to it since I told her a little tidbit. Uh, Tammy, oh, Ed really, it's un-American. Ed really hit the, uh, it's un-American really hit for you not to listen to this. On the head, man. <laughs> he, it was he, really he good. He mentioned he mentioned a, a heroic story, and and he I don't think he could have been more accurate about that. I mean that that is one heck of an interview. You, you guys know, haven't heard about this story uh, that more tornado that pretty much leveled the city back in 2013. Yeah. Uh, this Jeep was one of the few surviving vehicles out of that whole thing. And and what this man did with that vehicle uh, is just unbelievable. Uh, you guys got to go check that out. Episode 130-ish. Yeah, I don't have that right in front of me here. But, but go check it out, guys. One heck of a show. You got to go listen to that one. I'll, uh, I'll look that up and put it in the show notes, the exact uh, oh, episode. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, so jeeptalkshow.com. Uh, just look at our show notes for this episode. And uh, you'll, uh, I'll, I'll probably just have a link straight to that episode that you can listen to. Or you could always go to uh, your Amazon uh, Echo and listen to it from there. Mm. See what I did there? Hey, you want to leave us a five-star review? Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and you'll find all the ways that you can do that. Greetings and llamifications. This is the Super Croc again. You know, I was reviewing past episodes and and I, when when Tammy was quote unquote sick, I believe that episode. Though I knew I you was. guys were talking about the, <laughs> her missing, stolen, or maybe here's a new one: alien. It was stolen. <laughs> was what, is there some strange lights in the area that time? D rings, but. The question is, then, now, Josh is really adamant that he's pretty sure that they just fell off and lost him. No, oh, they didn't. <laughs> Same with Tony. The question is, wrong. Were, were Josh's car slash car actually yeah. stolen? Or did he just lose them and forget to put oh, parts back on? I see. <laughs> you know, one of those late night work on your car type of things. I've heard of that happening, you know. And, and then Josh taking off for your birthday. Really? Not hanging out with your favorite people? <laughs> yeah. That makes him sad. Guilt. Well, you guys Guilt. have fun. <laughs> oh, gee. Well, he was, he was really spreading it around Maybe. there, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, maybe jo- maybe you just misplaced your Honda. Josh. Exactly. Maybe, sure. Sure. Yeah. maybe it fell off. <laughs> no, I, honestly, honestly, the first time that my car was stolen, I went down to the end of the driveway and I'm looking up and down the street like, well, maybe it just kind of coasted down the street <laughs> it by itself, you know. <laughs> it's a standard. Maybe I forgot to put the e-brake on. It, it's a standard, right? It is a right? stick. It yeah, is yeah. a stick. So yeah. it's always possible, so, you know, you get there, it, it, you it don't. Was, it was it was a plausible situation. It could have happened. And boy, so, wish, don't you wish it had? That would have been nice. Oh yeah. And and the and, the other three times or the other two times after that. And I forgot too. I was listening to the episode about when I and I was sick legitimately. I won't get into details because that's too too much information. <laughs> but I was yelling at my computer when oh, I good. was listening to that. <laughs> It was stolen. <laughs> I what, know it was. It was stolen from it. the Safeway grocery store parking lot. <laughs> I think we lot. called it. That's <laughs> what we were aiming for. I mean, that's the whole show. That was what we aimed for. Is that you guys screaming at your, your audio device, whatever you're playing on? No, you stupid idiots. <laughs> it's not that way. <laughs> I was not off-roading when it disappeared. I was in the grocery store. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> oh, so... so uh, it was a, a, probably a basket bumped into the thing, and it was so loose it just fop, plopped into the bottom of the basket, and yeah, then it yeah. got wheeled away. There you go. Mystery solved. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you betcha. <laughs> You're listening to Jeep Talk Show, Talk Show. the number, number one Jeep podcast. podcast. At my mom's house. From around the world. Or from your city. And sometimes just down the street. Howdy, neighbor. It's the Jeep Talk Show interview. 
This week, I'm excited to bring to you somebody in, well, out of the same kind of industry that I used to work in, out of the electrical field. He is known by his company named Jeep Cables, and you can find him over at jeepcables.com. We have the owner, Paul, here in-house tonight to talk with us. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So let's get into what Jeep Cables is and, and, and how you got there. So <clears throat> Jeep Cables started out because I was really... Um, you know, I've got this XJ and I was really trying to do everything I could to improve, you know, the function of it. And, you know, it's just, you, you start down those paths. And oh, yeah. I was trying to find well, battery cables, which should be fairly simple. And I couldn't find anybody that was making them. Um, there had been people that made them in the past and they'd stopped doing it. Or there were companies that were making something that was kind of more, uh, you know, an assembly yourself kit. And I was uh-huh. really looking at this from the perspective I want to, I want something that I don't have to mess with. I don't want anything that I have to, you know, put together. I just want to be able to, to get and, and do, and, and there was nothing like that out there. So I, you know, I, uh, I've got as minimal electric background, um, you know, nothing professional, obviously. Uh, but I started looking at, you know, what kind of materials, if I was going to build this, what I want. And I started, you know, with assembling a kit and, and I was really proud of it. So I showed off a guy I worked with and I was like, check this out. And I, you know, he's like, wow, that's awesome. Can you make a set for me? And I said, sure, <laughs> I, I can do that. We came to an agreement on price and he showed it to a friend. And then there were a couple more people who were asking about it. And then I went on Reddit and I advertised it on the uh, Cherokee XJ for uh, subreddit. Then pretty soon Facebook and, and I, it's, I, you know, it's been really, um, I've gotten to meet a lot of great people and, and deliver a product that I feel that, that I'm very proud of and I, you know, definitely stand behind. Well, it sounds like you've pretty much opened Pandora's box there by uh, offering <laughs> something that a lot of people are, are you know, really going after. I myself uh, went through this phase uh, early and often, and, and I've hooked up several friends by making something similar along the lines. You know, oh, I've got a bad charging cable. Oh, this one battery cable is a little crusty, a little stiff. Oh, maybe we should yeah. do something about that. That sort of thing, but really, you're right. There's never been a an all-in-one kit, you know, really off-the-shelf solution, plug and play, ready to go to swap out what I consider, what I think a lot of people consider, is really lackluster cables on the Jeep. Oh, definitely. Those, the, if you once you I mean, you know, having looked at it, a, a number of them now. I mean, the charging cables. I mean, you know, a Jeep. Uh, you know, in 2001 was the last year they were made, so. You know, 17 years old, the 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 battery terminals start to fall apart, and I, people have the crazy marine ones that you like tighten down with like the strap at the end. Uh, it, it's uh, starting the the charging system is essential, and there's a number of grounds that are important. I mean, the Renix guys will yeah. definitely you know understand that there's so many grounds that are important, and that you know shortcuts that AMC made way back when, and so let's let's hey. talk about uh, let's talk a little bit about about your Jeep and how you know sort of uh, your Jeep life and and how you got to be a Jeeper more or less. Uh, so I'm on my fourth XJ. Uh, they've all been the HOs. So I've had 91, 93, a 96, and now I'm on a 99. And I selected this one because it was OBD2 because I hate troubleshooting electrical issues. Mm. So I got the OBD2, but I didn't get the the uh, the heads that were the 0331 heads. Oh, so good. I kind of like picked the best year. Uh, I've had a Rubicon, and that was fun, but I didn't like making car payments. So um, it, it's just it's a great. I, the thing I love about Jeeps is really the the welcoming nature of the community. I mean, mm-hmm. you see somebody out there and, you know, you and your buddy are out there, you know, playing up in the woods and you see somebody who's stuck and it doesn't matter that if they don't even have to drive a Jeep. And you're like, hey, need any help? You're winching them out or, um, you know, you're just you're sharing something, whether it's a trail ride that's organized or it's just a group of people that are just kind of, you know, going out as friends. I mean, you you make memories and, and families remember that you can, you know, you. I talk to my kids, we go, um, we'll drive up to the uh, mountains near me and we'll go snow uh, uh, sledding. 
you know, every, every winter and the kids love it. And they'll always talk about, Oh, that time we got stuck or that <laughs> for the good times. It's always like, right. That yeah. Time we got stuck. <laughs> um, so, so r- real quick, let me, let me ask you something. Do you, do you have, is it just XJ right now or are there other Jeeps kind of uh, in the works? I do. I do XJ and I do WJ. Um, I've tried to get a couple people who, who wanted to, who had ZJs or CJs, I've tried to get that community in and I really haven't had anybody who's, who's interested. I mean, there's people that are interested, but I need things from them. Like I need measurements like, Hey, I'm going to need you to measure a few things for me. Cause I don't, if I had a, a CJ, a WJ, a ZJ and an XJ, I would probably be sleeping in one of them. And I it would probably be, you know, I would, my wife would not tolerate, you know, a, a yard full of Jeeps yeah, as, right. as much as that would be, you know, there is a, and I just saw a Cherokee chief for sale near me. And I was like, Oh, wouldn't that be awesome to have a full size Jeep? That would be <laughs> so not into that, but, um, it, it really takes, um, just a few measurements and I can, and put together a set for, for almost anything. So Paul, can I ask you a question, um, yes. about the, the cables? Why I'm, you know, I, I can't say that I'm new to the Jeep community anymore, but I'm nope. pretty pretty new. I'm I'm a Jeep owner for five years. I have a I bought a brand new um, Jeep. Why would somebody need Jeep cables? So the cables are, are the engine. The, the temperatures underneath, especially in an XJ, uh, the temperatures underneath the hood are so high that they barely. I mean, the, the plastic over time and rubber over time hardens and then it cracks. Um, the cables start to wear, the the ends start to wear, corrosion starts to creep up the cables. And and as mentioning earlier, you know, the oldest, the newest XJ is, is really 17 years old. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, those are like you're wearing, you know, 17 year old shoes. They probably wouldn't look good. And these cables right. were probably at the time barely sufficient. I mean, if you've done an alternator at any point, you if you were doing a basic mod to a Jeep and you're you're replacing the 95 amp alternator and you've got like you know, some light and you've got some lights, a bigger amp, a compressor, air lockers. I mean, all those things draw power and the stock wiring is thinner than a pencil. It's not really strong wire. It, it's really probably on the operating end of its, its capacity. So putting bigger wire in allows those devices to function at, at a much greater efficiency and, and with good wire, you're not ever going to have to worry about replacing it. I mean, I would say that properly done, it should last the lifetime of the vehicle. I mean, definitely, you know, these are, the, these are improvements that, you know, we'll spend money on a winch. We'll spend, you know, $1,200 on a nice worn, but then we'll put, you know, a Walmart battery or something. And, you, you know, you think about one piece of a whole system lets the rest of it down and cables are really the transmission for all of that power that's flowing back and forth. So good cables cut your starting times down. It you can have weird computer glitches that occur from junky cables. I mean, it's cables seem like a really it seems like a no-brainer until you start trying to chase down issues and then you can go off on these crazy tangents and not realize there was just a ground that was, you know, was junky or had been, you know, the the braided grounds get garbaged up and rot out, especially if you're back east. You can see a lot of damage yeah, from the weather. Definitely. So what would one look for? What would be a sign? Like, can you just physically look at them and say, oh, yep, these are some pretty bad cables? Definitely, definitely. Um, especially near the battery terminals, the the lead, uh, the lead that composes the uh, the lug for the, the battery. It'll start to fray mm-hmm. the uh, plastic near or leading into it. You can see the green corrosion pretty readily. Um, if your alternator is starting slow, it comes up on Facebook all the time. It's, my Jeep is starting slow. I just replaced the battery. The alternator's good. I took it to AutoZone or, or O'Reilly's, and the, the, bat, the alternator's good. So then you start looking at what other things, and, and really the biggest thing is, you know, the, the, these cables that are coming from these power sources, if they're not in good shape and I mean, if they're brittle or if they're breaking, um, if there's electrical tape on it, if it looks like, 
the previous owner assembled it after a couple cases of Bud Light. I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. I mean, this, you can fix a lot of things with really good cables. Yeah, it's true. And, and working in the uh, automotive electrical industry for for over a decade, I I'd pretty much seen it all in my time. And and I, <laughs> and I still I do Jeep builds on the side. I still do a lot of electrical work on the side, freelance, and and, and I, I run into this stuff all the time. And yeah, generally it is on older Jeeps. You're not going to see a you know a really you know corroded through uh, a cable on a battery on a Jeep that's only a few years old. But that's not to say that there isn't room for improvements. Now, I know on the Cherokees and the TJs and you know the XJs, the ZJs, a lot of those it's an 8 gauge primary on there. And and yes. so and that's that's the biggest that's the biggest. Now, I think it even goes down to 10 gauge on some of the grounds and stuff. And so what what sort of improvements are you making over just the size of the wire? So the over just the size, um, my standard set is a 4 gauge and I offer a larger 2 gauge. Uh, oh, I've wow. actually also done a one aught, which was really awesome because that Good stuff's Lord. as thick as your thumb. I mean, yeah. I don't even At know least. how that would. You're gonna, <laughs> you're running. I think the the guy was running a 250 amp alternator. Anyways, um, the the other things you're looking at is the quality of the cable. Um, is it copper? It's not like copper clad aluminum. Uh, a lot of guys will tell me they're like, I can build this stuff. I can get the the wiring off of eBay and I can assemble it and. You know, uh, probably having worked in electronics, you, you see that oil is uh, can break down the jackets on uh, wire. So you'll see where people get eBay wire or China wire, and the uh, oil. You know, it's not like Jeeps don't leak, and I mean, we're as bad as Harley right. sometimes. <laughs> oil gets on things, and it eventually just starts breaking down the jacket because the jacket's made out of a petroleum base. That's I mean, right. the, the cable I'm using is. Specifically, and this is a little technical, it's J1127 and it's an, an SAE spec. So it's you know a group of people and a group of engineers sat down and decided if we're going to make transmission cables for you know power under the hood, it has to be withstand extreme temperatures, hot and cold. Um, it has to have a certain amount of copper. It has to be you know some uh, a certain number of strands. It's got to withstand a bending at a certain degree. Uh, abrasion so we're going to test it against a, a an abrasive surface and see how long it takes to wear through the jacket i mean this is above and beyond what you know people normally do and that's even down to the terminals um i use copper over tinned because copper has a higher uh, connectivity than tinned and has a little less on the maintenance side but we're you know we're jeep owners we're used to maintaining things so you get underneath there you put a little dielectric grease on the connectors and and really, we're just, you know, caretakers of these Jeeps. You know, somebody else has had this before us in a lot of cases, and we're just doing the best to maintain it. And, you know, a lot of the guys out there and a lot of girls driving these things to work every day, and you want to make sure that things are reliable. So do you make well, these, sounds like you hand make these yourself? Every single, <laughs> every single one. And I wow. was joking with somebody about, I, I don't, um, I, I wish I could streamline it, but then I wouldn't be able to put the quality into it. It's just a matter of sitting there at my workbench and I build each set. You know, there it it looks good when you're done and and I've people tell me all the time they're like, I got these cables, they look amazing and they work amazing. I mean it's I mean I I've, I've seen some people's attempts at wiring and you know it it's but some people consider automotive wiring is is amazing. It <laughs> mm-hmm. How oh, long yeah. does it take I've... you to make a set? What's that? How long does it take you to make a set of them? Uh, usually about 20 to 40 minutes. Depends on oh, wow. um, how fast I'm working that night. I've usually got a podcast on, whether it's you guys or um, a gaming podcast or something. I'll just have a podcast and I just kind of get into a rhythm and... Um, I, I make them as I get them. So I don't, you know, the, a lot of people have custom requirements. They, they've replaced the air compressor with an alternator. So they want a longer cable so they can, since they've top mounted the alternator or they've got a, a second battery that they want to have included in it. So they've got an isolator that's this far away. And I just, I just get their measurements and I build them a set of cables. 
Well, and it sounds like you're using uh, above industry standard materials. I, I for one, know uh, what you're talking about in, in what goes into into the set of these things. And and you are above the curve, I'm going to say, you know, as far as like standard <laughs> shop you. supplies. I mean, you go in, you go, seriously, though, you go into, you know, one of the top reputable automotive, automotive electronics retail outlets and you're getting some, you know, a, a system installed and they're using the large gauge wire to hook up your amps, you know, stuff like that. And the, all of the connectors and the wiring and everything like that is pretty much at the bottom of the spectrum. And I'm not talking about, you know, it's a, definitely above the eBay stuff that you're going to get, the stuff you're going to find online coming out of China or whatever. But at the same time, it's on the lower end of the SAE approved. Yeah, sure, it's going to hold up to some of the temps. And it, yeah, it might, you know, hold up to some splashes of gasoline and oil and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But after about five, six, seven years, it's going to be discolored. It's going to start to oxidize a little bit. And you're going to start to see, you know, maybe uh, some stiff points or, you know, that that uh, that shielding is going to start to degrade a little bit. It doesn't last forever. Now, the stuff that you're exactly. talking about, however, that's going to be 10, 15, 20 years underneath the hood uh, that you're going to be yeah. good for. And especially with the terminals that you're using and everything else. So, folks, he's using top of the line stuff here and, and uh, made in the USA, man. It doesn't get any better than yeah, that. Yeah, I really, I mean, you know, you think about we ship jobs overseas and, we're, you know, everybody's concerned about, you know, making sure that there's people that are working. And I guess it, made in America for me is a huge thing. It's a source of pride and, and knowing that I'm buying things that are made in America that are employing other Americans. And I mean, it's, you know, it's a good feeling. It really is. You know, we, we take care of ourselves and you can't, we're not always going to have these partnerships with other countries that are going to make things cheap for us. We're just, we're going to have to rely on our own intuition and, and, and abilities to get things done. Now, speaking of overseas, now you and I had talked uh, off the air yes. a little bit, and there was an announcement that you wanted to put out there for anybody who's listening and uh, maybe some fans of Jeep Cables and future customers as well. What, what's going on behind the scenes and that might have to do with some over the sea, overseas stuff? So behind the scenes, I am a National Guardsman with the Oregon Air National Guard. Um, I've been with it for uh, 12 years at this point, actually more if you count active duty time. But I'm getting ready to deploy to Afghanistan. Uh, so Jeep Cables is, obviously I can't run a cable business from uh -huh. no. a, a dorm in a 12-hour different time zone. So um, I'm going to try and build up a bunch of cables before I go and make sure that my wife has access to the email account and that she can get in and fill any orders. Um, I'm going to have to do a lot of boxing and a lot of late nights, but I want to be able to make sure that there's, you know, people are able to buy or that, that if they're interested, that there's going to be, I, I don't just want to leave people hanging and people who are interested, who are maybe waiting for, you know, next payday before they buy a set of cables. I want to be able to take care of people um, while I'm out of the country, so. And if you were making them over there, technically they wouldn't be made in America. No, they wouldn't be made oh. in America. <laughs> Good <laughs> That's point. Excellent point. I, yeah, and it might draw some really weird looks when I've got like a footlocker full of wire and you know. And yeah. Stuff and people oh yeah. Like, <laughs> That's the movie Hurt Locker all over again here. Oh yeah, it'll be like yeah. What this is? This isn't. This is not. This is not safe. No. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> So, okay, so, so uh, let, let's get down to brass tacks here. You know, um, how much time do people have until, well, it might be a little bit of a while, you know, before orders get shipped again? Uh, you know, when, when are you shipping out? So I'm shipping out in April. Uh, I don't have oh. a 100% date because I'm joining another unit um, on my way over. So I have to make sure there's uh, schedules have to line up. I'm going to stop taking orders probably the 21st it stays right the around 15th, the corner yeah. 16th yeah yeah so there's a period of time where i i want to make sure that i have time to spend with my family and that you know i'm not trying to get cables done all you know at night and yeah i just want to jump in here real quick and say this whole damn interview has been a big tease <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm all excited about these cables and now they're not going to be available <laughs> <laughs> well, order them right. Get, get, get your credit card. I, that's out. why I'm going to try and build up as many as I can. Um, I'm getting ready to put a large order in with my supplier, and I'm going to try and make as many as I can so that I have 
inventory, albeit you know, in not an indefinite, uh, not an infinite supply, but that I'll have enough to be able to supply, hopefully, all the customers that would seek them out for well, at least is- two months, two and a half months, enough time to get me back in the country and, and building cables again. I was just about to say this. This is only going to be a a, a short, temporary hiatus. Yeah. Uh, your deployment isn't oh. going to be forever, so you know you're no. going to be coming back. And <laughs> it's back, only a three month work, deployment. So, so. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I oh, feel yeah. better then. Three months isn't so bad. <laughs> I can. I we can. <laughs> but I can make sure you have a set before I leave. <laughs> but but be safe over there. And uh, again, uh, I'm sure you've heard it numerous times. Thank you for your service. No, I I, I it's um. I love the, I love this country, and in service is just something that I consider, you know, just just me giving back. It's me doing something that, you know, that that you know, it's upholding the values of the you know the um, the American way and and ensuring that people here and abroad are safe. Well, I know that you can't give back by giving these things away. What's what's their <laughs> what's our price point that we're looking at here? What's our you know from from this point to this point? You know what's our what's our entry level to our best you know the best kit you offer? What are people going to be looking to spend on these? So I don't I don't run sales. I don't do discounts. Um, mm-hmm. I just cable set of cables, a four gauge cables with whatever with up with a hundred fifty amp fuse because anything over one hundred fifty the length of the game. Anyways, hundred dollars for my four gauge set. 140 for my two gauge set. Um, I do customs. And so if somebody says, Hey, can you build it in one aught? Yeah, I can do that. Um, I actually built a, an extension cable for uh, Nick from Nick and times. I built him a, oh, a yeah. one aught cable. He said, he said, like, Hey, I want to, I want a cable and I'm going to run an air compressor off it and a stereo. And I was like, okay, well, let's figure out your amperage that you're drawing. Let's figure out, okay, so you need to have a fuse that's this size and the wire has to be, since it's this distance, want to make sure that you're getting full current at that. So there's, it wasn't just, sure, dude, I'll throw you some cables together. It was, you know, I really worked with Nick to make sure that the cables he got fit his needs. So anything like that, that's actually fun stuff too. It sounds like these are purpose built. I mean, you, you got some math involved in there. You're doing your research, you know, things are set up exactly the way they need to be for you know, what these wires are and what they're doing. Now, uh, what are we getting here? Are we just getting a, a couple of cables with uh, some ends on them and a fuse? I mean, what, what's all in the kit here? Let's so you know, let's make sure people I, have I a good understanding of what we're getting. My big seven, usually you hear like the big three or big four. I call it the big seven because oh. there's really seven cables involved. Um, oh, wow. You've got you know, three grounds because there's one that goes from the fender to the battery and one that goes from the battery to the engine block. And then the cylinder head to the firewall, and then you've got all your positive leads. So going from the battery to the PDC or the relay and the, on the Renix, and then down to the, uh, alternator. And, but so the alternator, when we're upgrading these systems, we're getting rid of the fusible link. Um, fusible links are, are great when you're working with compact wiring bundles, but it, they're really awful for, you know, long-term serviceability. So what I do is I, have the alternator lead and then there's a fuse an anl fuse because it's really easy to find an anl sized fuse anywhere practically yeah. and then that from that anl fuse to the fuse block and then i use um they're called ordnance style they're military style battery terminal because they're awesome because you can attach things without disconnecting your battery and for those of us who have like a lot of presets on their radio or <laughs> a lot of things like that that, that have a memory you can add something to that cable set without totally disconnecting it from the battery. So, I mean, you should really anyways, theoretically disconnect, but sometimes we kind of don't listen to that rule, but, um, don't always yeah, follow directions. What's that? I said, we don't always follow directions. We don't, you know, even though it says like you're, you're changing your spark plug and the service manual says disconnect the battery. And you're like, I'm doing spark plugs. Oh, yeah. Not really that yeah. bad, but, um, yeah, I, I, the ordnance style plugs or, or the ordnance style terminals are are heavier. It's just great, and everything's heat shrinked. I use marine grade heat shrink. I hydraulically crimp every terminal because I've seen some. They're called um, hammer and hammer and bang um, yep. crimpers where you're just smashing wires together. A good crimp is oxygen free. That there's no room for oxygen to go in there and corrode any of those wires. So a nice good crimp that's oxygen free you get the 
the heat shrink that keeps it that keeps moisture out yeah you're right the, these things will last 15 20 years and hopefully beyond hopefully there's people that are running these cables you know as as long as they own it i mean ideally you'd be able to hand this down to your your kids and they'd have maybe my cables will still be on that jeep if we haven't gone awesome. to like hybrid engines or something crazy in the next 60 years so well it sounds like with with what they're made and what's gone into them these things will certainly last a lifetime tell people where they can go to go find these to check out the pictures to price them out to see all the kinds of stuff the jeep cables is doing and 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 what we're let's start directing people to uh, where to find you okay um i'm on uh facebook at jeep cables I'm on Instagram, jeepcables.com, and I've got my website, jeepcables.com. Um, there you go. So pretty much uh, I, I, just do a search <laughs> for Jeep Cables and people will be able to find you, yeah? Yeah, and I should be the first result. If you look on Google, just type Jeep Cables. I mean, I've got so many ways to, you know, so many ways to find me. And I'm responsive to emails. I'm responsive to Facebook, um, Instagram. Oh, there's a lot of awesome Jeeps on on Instagram. I yeah, so, yeah <laughs> there are. I don't know. It's so many. It's like Pinterest for guys is like Instagram with Jeeps. I mean, it's insane. So uh, yeah, I try to be active on all the social platforms. Um, it's you know people aren't just Facebook anymore. They're not just in, they're not just going to web pages. We're going to Instagram. We're going to you know, mm-hmm. uh, Pinterest. I mean, there's obviously there's tons of places. Oh and, yeah, and we, I try to be on all. We of them. love our pictures. Yeah, we do love but, our pictures indeed. Well, <laughs> Paul, I can't thank you enough for for being on tonight. Uh, I want to get you back to your family and stuff like that. We'll have all the links uh, to the to the website, to the Instagram, to Facebook on the uh, show notes for this episode. All you guys got to do is head over to JeepTalkShow.com and check out for episode 324. The show notes there. And we're going to have all the links to where you guys can uh, hook up with Paul and and uh, find out more about what he's doing. And, of course, see what he's doing and maybe even put in an order. And, of course, uh, Paul, make sure you, get, you keep your head down, buddy. Uh, we don't want to have anything <laughs> happen to you. We'd hate to have those orders not get filled now. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, definitely. I, I appreciate that. And um, I just want to. Tony, uh, Josh, and Tammy, I just want to thank you all for having me on, and, oh, and yeah. I appreciate getting a chance to speak with you. Absolutely, and we're going to have to have you back uh, when you get back as well. We'd like to learn more about Jeep cables and, of course, how your deployment went and all that. So oh, yeah, uh, we'll have to have you back on in the future. All right, thank you. Yep, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, big thanks again goes out to Paul Roth for taking the time to talk about Jeep cables and, well, his upcoming deployment as well. Keep your head down, Paul, and watch out for those camel spiders. Oh, God, those things are horrible. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, do you guys have an idea for a guest? Maybe you want to be a guest yourself here on the Jeep Talk Show. Well, just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and share your idea for our next great guest. Maybe it's you. We'll drop us your contact information, and we'll reach out. Hey, and if you own a hard top for your Jeep, listen up. Coming up next week to talk about one of the most innovative inventions to hit the Jeep scene in decades, we're going to have the man behind the one thing that will make going topless easier than buttering toast. Barry will be here to talk about Top Lift Pros. Mmm, toast. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And, uh... We are seven times more likely to see Bigfoot give Elvis a piggyback ride than we are to see the Super Croc in his natural habitat. Oh my uh, God, Super Croc, it's good to hear from you again. <laughs> uh, glad to see you're still a Jeep owner. Sad to see that you're still having Jeep problems. Uh, give you some words of wisdom. Uh, when you ha- own a Jeep, you're only one engine away from the perfect Jeep. And... If you want to drive a Jeep every day, you have to have three of them. Uh, keep plugging away at it, buddy. And uh, if I remember correctly, you had a CJ at one time. How, how's that? Let us know how that's coming along. And uh, all right, short and sweet this week. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, we won't buy. Uh, I think he had a scrambler. Would that be considered a CJ? I thought he had a uh, CJ. I was thought it was a CJ. CJ? CJ? Yeah, I thought it was a CJ too. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm probably remember- remembering wrong. I was thinking it was a scrambler, but maybe not. You must have needed this every day. I need it. 
It's the Jeep Talk Show's must-have stuff. Pick of the week for your Jeep. So let's say you have an ARB twin air compressor, and now you are left with the task of where to mount it and how to plumb it in for use. Well, now there's a complete solution in one handy kit. Innovative JK Products has taken all the guesswork out and developed a complete solution for your tire inflation needs on your four-door Jeep JKU. Innovative JK Products came up with a solution to address many of the common problems with onboard air systems. Dirt, mud, overheating, lack of space, and of course, leaks. Your ARB compressor is mounted under the passenger seat with this kit. Safe from the elements and the heat. It's a zero residual pressure system. Once you are done inflating your tires, the system returns to a neutral state. There's no pressure left in the line or in the system that would be subject to expansion and contraction due to changes in temperature or altitude, etc. This means less stress on the components and the seals. Only one threaded connection to make in this entire kit. That means less pipe tape, no pipe paste, or multiple threaded connections to deal with, and less opportunity for leaks in the long run. There's no typical bulky and restrictive quick connectors. This system uses simple, clean-looking, and non-restrictive connections. You do not have to open your hood, crawl under your vehicle, or clean dirt or mud off your air connections at all. You can even close your door to that first click, you know, that almost closed position with the airlines connected for those cold and rainy days to stay warm and dry inside your Jeep while your tires inflate. The kit includes everything you need to mount, plumb, wire, and use your system to inflate anywhere from one to all four tires all at once. This is really cool, guys. If you have one of those compressors, you have a JKU, you need this kit. Now, wait a minute. Is this the same? Am I listening to this correctly? This allows you to air up your tires without hooking anything up to them? Well, no. So you do have to. So basically what this is for our podcast listeners out there who um, haven't gone to the website and clicked on the link from this episode to this product. Oh, maybe you have. Basically, <laughs> maybe you have. And you know what I'm talking about. Maybe no, you have I'm this kit already. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what this kit is, is it's a mounting kit and a, um, a couple of ports which you hook hoses up to. Mm-hmm. And the hoses have a special T fitting attached to them. And you basically it, it has one of these little port blocks on on each front seat. So you mount these things on the side of each of your of your front seats. And they're, they're, they're it's all it snaps in, bolts in, it's all there's no modifications needed or anything. The air compressor gets mounted underneath the seat and and it hooks up to this stuff and then you just pull out the hose kit, ah, okay. attach it to the terminal and run the lines to the tires. That's it. Gotcha. You don't have to crawl under. There's no, you know, you don't have to pop the hood or anything like that. It's all accessible from inside the vehicle, except for when you make the connection at the tire. Now it comes with uh, the, you know, ten set, uh, ten foot selection of hose uh, for each side, uh, so plenty of room to get to both front and rear tires, as well as even airing up your buddies that are on either side of you because they don't have onboard air like you do. I got you. Okay. No, the reason why I, I asked that was is because when you started talking about this, I was thinking, man, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to get the same uh, air tire airing system that they have on the military Humvee, the H1, where it yeah. just it's always hooked up and the tires will balance each other. Or you, I, I'm not sure if it has an air compressor or not, but I know that the tires will yeah. actually balance pressure between them, uh, depending on the settings. And I thought, man, it'd be so great if you, if we could actually do something like that. I mean, you literally could could roll up, tunes jamming, windows up, AC blaring, uh, hit the button for the uh, electronic disconnect. Uh, for the uh, the sway bar, hit the buttons to deflate down to the proper PSI, go wheeling, never make any eye contact with anybody on the trail. Yeah. <laughs> Are you making fun of me, Tony? <laughs> and, and get all the way back out, sitting at the highway, press another button, and they air up to, you know, 32 or whatever they need to be Well, at. <laughs> this is going to be a little bit uh, less user-friendly yeah, than that, yeah. if you will. No, this is definitely a step down from that. This 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 isn't quite as plug-and-play as that would be, um, but this is about as good as it's going to get. Yeah. Now, whether this is going to work, uh, could be modified for other vehicles, I don't know. Uh, this could certainly be retro to work with other vehicles, providing you have the room, uh, providing you want to get creative with the mounting and stuff like that. But this kit was designed for the JKUs. Uh, you can go check it out uh, for the links uh, the links to this product over at JeepTalkShow.com, episode 324. Damn it, man. We're Jeep owners. We've got JB Weld, JB Weld and duct tape. We can make anything fit. So tonight's Cherokee love information is truly a Cherokee-only info thing. <laughs> now... 
<laughs> before you non Cherokee owners finish groaning and looking for that oh. fast, yeah, exactly, fast forward button. And Nikki G says, "I can fast forward." <laughs> He's going straight to his his part of the show from now on. Uh, this may not be specific the sp- 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 river. This specific. it's a river <laughs> specific to <laughs> you, <laughs> to your Jeep. <laughs> Let me start that one over. This may not be specific to your Jeep, but this <laughs> goofiness may help you figure out a similar problem in the future. Man, I love me some bright lights, LED light bars, uh, you know, headlights, running lights, blinkers, backups. I need a Tim uh, Allen uh, grunt here. All, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, a few how months. About those, how about those black lights? Oh, black lights would be pretty cool. You could see, uh, take those into the uh, the hotel with you and see what if they really cleaned. Uh, a few months back, I was checking the prices on the LED bulbs uh, of all my exterior lights, and I found prices have really gone down. So I ordered some uh, 3177s. I think that's the number. Uh, LED bulbs, front, rear, yellow, red, uh, and white. Good Lord, them backup lights are white and bright, but I digress. <laughs> now, I was well aware of the fast blinking issue uh, and was prepared with a new LED relay. I wasn't prepared for what happened to, what happened to, happened to the next. So I had a weird ass issue. Josh, I, I'm pretty sure I told you about this in chat one, one day. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is, this is, uh, if you're a Cherokee owner and if you've been through this, you know immediately what I'm talking about, or maybe you don't and it's driving you nuts like it did me. If, if I turn the signal, you know, a left signal, the left mm-hmm. signal would, the, the, the yellow bulb would light up, but the brake lights would also flash and the third brake light would flash, but at, at very much dimmer uh, than the, the, the yellow one. So, okay, but not great. I mean, I could see an accident being caused and, and me being the uh, being ticketed because I was <laughs> sending confusing signals. Are you breaking? Are you, are you signaling? What, what exactly are you doing? So, uh, right turn signal, the same thing. Okay, fine. It's not that bright. Uh, let's just drive with it like that. And then one day, it was uh, raining out. It was kind of dark, and I turned my headlights on. And I was trying to signal, and I found that whenever I pressed the brakes, the signal would stop. It would stop blinking, <laughs> but only with the headlights on. Oh. I'm serious, folks. This is this is just nuts. Okay, so my my Jeep came up for inspection uh, in uh, February, and I you know did a bunch of other things that didn't have anything to do with working on it until uh, March. <laughs> So I was out there, uh, actually I I was doing some digging around on the internet again, and I found a couple of YouTube videos that referenced the factory, uh, wiring harness for the trailer lighting because my Jeep came with a a factory trailer, uh, kit and the, the harness. So it turns out they got a little box in there that does something. Uh, and, and if the, if the load isn't correct by using the incandescent bulbs, it changes up a bunch of things, the voltage paths or something. So uh, I found that partially, this, yes. Uh, well, well uh, I don't know. A couple things, a couple things were likely going on. I I, I know where you're going Thanks. with uh, with this. Yeah, yeah, go go go. <laughs> okay, so so in in the '97 to 2001 Cherokees that came with a tow package, um, they came standard with the 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 trailer harness, mm-hmm. uh, which is the what is it, the four pin. Uh, I think it's four, four, the, the flat one. Uh, it's either four pin or five pin. I, I forgot which one. Um, but, uh, and, and the way that that works, those, the, those trailer lights that are set up for that plug have a common brake light and turn signal. Um, and so what this does is in the, in all that wiring that's in the driver's side rear quarter panel of the 97 to 2001 Cherokees, there, there is, um, there's essentially a factory harness back there yes. that the that the uh, dealerships would for when they install the um, the, the tow package, uh, which is a dealership option. Um, it um, they add in this other harness which plugs into this factory wiring, and what it does is it basically steps down the wiring from you know full turn signal, parking light, brake light, um, reverse light, and all that down to common. Um, to where the brake light and the turn signal are one, essentially. And so when you put in the LEDs um, in there, you're basically backfeeding voltage back through that into the rest of the system. And so it's, it's 
and there's probably a combination in there as well without the 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 load that it would have seen the the uh, the factory flash relay which would ordinarily prevent that backfeeding of voltage I don't think was doing what it was supposed to so you, I think you might have had a combination of things going on back there but it should be a relatively easy fix there the harness I believe just sort of unplugs it's a, it's a, the, the the trailer wiring section of that harness in the back quarter panel I think just unplugs and uh, at one end of it plugs back into the factory wiring and, and you should be good to go. Um, otherwise, it's all back to stock lighting. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Uh, two months ago when I was telling you about this problem uh, in uh, uh, Google Hangouts, why the hell didn't you mm -hmm. tell me this? Uh, because I, I well, he wasn't paying attention. To I, know. I didn't know. I didn't know that you had a, uh, had a trailer, uh, a tow package on yours. I've, I've never heard you about you know, recovery point in the rear or that you had a trailer or that you've ever towed anything. Uh, I just, I, I just assumed that you didn't have a tow package. Yeah, My chair didn't come time. with a tow package. Yeah. I'm just, um, and I, so I just, I didn't, I didn't put two and two together, but when you started talking about trailer, uh, wiring and stuff, it was like, ah, oh, wait a minute here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know what's going on here. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, I actually took it off. Uh, the one few times that I had been off road one time I was actually going up an embankment and uh, the, uh, the the toe hitch itself sticking out of the two-inch receiver was actually in the dirt, deep in oh, the yeah. dirt. And I thought, well, you know, damn it, Mark was right. I should have had the uh, the bumper made with a uh, the two-inch receiver in the bumper. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So that's you know. that's that's what I found out in the uh, on the YouTube video was that there's a uh, you know that harness is in there, and there's basically four connectors, uh, fairly good sized connectors back there. And oh. that's exactly what you do. You have to pull one of the connectors that goes to the harness that runs down, you know, to the bumper, unplug that one. And there's only one other connector there that it will, that you can move it, uh, move one, one of the four believe, or two. Yeah, it's, it's relatively idiot proof. You couldn't, you couldn't plug it into the wrong one. Exactly. Essentially. You, you, you might take a little bit of finagling to figure out. Okay, this one goes here. This one goes here. Okay, I, this is what I got to pull, you know. And and but I, I'm sure if you if you did some digging around, you might be able to find the link to the the video that Tony's talking about. And I think that they'll probably walk you through it. I'm I'm guessing. I don't I don't know. Yeah. Well, actually, I took some pictures, and I'm going to put those pictures Ooh. up on uh, oh, good. JeepTalkShow.com, and uh, with little arrows and stuff. You don't. There's no really no reason to to watch a long video about this. But it, but Josh is absolutely right. It is on the uh, driver's side rear quarter panel. Uh, inside and you pull that off and there's a, a nice big set of uh, uh, of uh, um, not jumpers uh, well, there's connectors a, that are there. there's They're a white. bracket yeah exactly yeah there's a bracket back there that the all the and it's it's they're all facing away from you so it's, yeah they're it's all in the inside mm -hmm. to get to yeah so you you, you kind of have to finagle there's around gonna back be there uh, tie wraps in my stuff. future because i pulled all that crap out of there with a with a ah, screwdriver i go. needed to see what i was doing but i will say this i think the reason why the brake lights were flashing uh, at, at a much dimmer rate is because they were leds and they did not require as much voltage to activate if they were an incandescent, they require a certain amount of uh, current uh, for them to, to light up. And I think that, that that voltage has always been present, but because the, the, you know you normally use incandescents, they just didn't uh, activate. They just didn't light up. Or if they did, you couldn't see it. So uh, it's just the, the, the low current capacity or, or necessity for the LEDs that I think were causing the, the flashing. But yeah, I was kind of concerned about going back, uh, having to go back with all the bulbs uh, not the headlights, but all the bulbs, uh, the blinker bulbs, so I could get uh, get past inspection. But I found the issue, uh, swapped those little uh, connectors around, and she's inspected. I'm just waiting for the sticker now. Hey, very good. Congrats. Woo woo. Ooh, did you see my blinkers when I was coming in? They're working. <laughs> You, you were coming in backwards. I was blinded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love those LED lights. They're so pretty. Yeah, you uh, posted up a, a pic, some pictures. I think when you first did the the swap around with the uh, the reverse lights, and good God Almighty, man, I'm surprised you haven't <laughs> melted the lenses. My uh, my wife said she. I think I said this in one of the posts that uh, she actually came out because I you know I had them blinking and stuff because I was taking pictures and also to just you know enjoying it. And it was dark outside uh, by the time I she got done. She thought you were them. getting arrested, didn't she? She, I she was thought the same thing. <laughs> she thought there was an ambulance at the neighbor's house oh, and, and no. the light. 
lights <laughs> were blinking, you know, and flashing off of yeah. the of the, the, yeah. the the houses. So she came out to check to see if there was an ambulance out there. She couldn't see. I, I was like, ah, oh, I was just so proud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, anything new on your front, uh, Josh? No, man. It, it's. <sighs> I've been so inundated with yard work that I've got to catch up on. It's like this does take priority over the Jeep. I've got to get on top of this stuff before, you know, spring springs too much. And uh, uh, and I'm left with, you know, crap. Now it's going to take me three months to get on top of this instead of three weeks. Oh, man, um, that's so just, that's it's it's been my focus. That, you know, it's priorities. That's too mature, life, you that's know too how mature it goes. man. That's just I don't like this. Side I know. Of you. Look at me <laughs> adulting and stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tammy, I don't. You you haven't been adulting here at all, have you? Oh, well, I finally got my family to go wheeling with me. Uh, <gasps> Carbon okay. monoxide poisoning. Uh, yeah. You <laughs> not, not all of them. Not my tranquilizer oldest. gun, right? <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Where the hell Zip are and track darts? <laughs> I, I told them we were going to a roller coaster park. Huh? Like, <laughs> oh yeah. No. Um, <laughs> Load up, r- remember, everybody. We're going to the amusement park. <laughs> right. Woohoo. <laughs> Um, remember when Gary, the Northwest Jeep, Northwest Jeepcast was on, and I mentioned Who? that there's no legal wheeling in Maryland, and he yes. goes, "Yes, there is," and I'm like, "No, there isn't." Well, he's like, "Yeah, this um, website trailsoffroad.com I mentioned the Frederick Watershed. I'm like, "Oh my gosh, that's really close to me. It's only 45 minutes away." So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go check this out. Remember last week I was talking to you guys. I'm like, "Should I go wheel by myself?" And you're right. We discussed that. So I went. My husband and my youngest son came with me. It's not too far away. It's the Frederick Municipal Forest, and it's a 7,000-acre oasis, and it's a watershed forest. And basically, it's 11 miles of gravel, dirt, slightly rocky roads um, coursing throughout this watershed. And on this website, they rated a, the, it's a technical rating of a 1 to 2. And basically, it's a dirt road. It, when we went, it was dry. There was one little water, water crossing, and it may have been a little bit more than three inches. Um, There's some ruts in it, some slight grades, up to 10 degrees. But I spent the whole time in two-wheel drive. The exciting thing is um, there were signs all over the plows. The snow plows don't plow past this point. And I'm like... Yes, this is where oh. I'm going to come when it snows. You don't think they would close uh, it when it snows, do you? No, oh, I good. there there were no, you know, like how you see those barriers and mm-hmm. stuff. So anyway, and it was actually there's this really beautiful creek. Um, my son had a blast, and he was like, "Mom, we should really do this every weekend. Go on these day trips." Ooh, and I know, I know. And, and she uh, teared up and couldn't drive for 15 yeah. minutes because she couldn't see. <laughs> um, and the cool thing is my husband took videos of my Jeep. There's some really, um, I get to see the outside of my Jeep instead of over the hood shots. Um, I did a little video. It's on YouTube. Um, the funny thing is in the description, it says these are easy roads and would certainly not be considered an off-road destination. Uh, and my son, in the video, you hear him is like, "Mom, this isn't really an off-road trail," because as we're passing by, you can also hike. There's like little pull-offs where people park and they get out and hike in the in this forest. And they were minivans yeah, on these yeah, roads. Yeah. So, I was, I was going to so, say that that moment when the the compass uh, came screaming by you and said, "Put it in four-wheel right. drive, damn it!" That was uh, was, right. was your clue. But, it, you know, it was nice. It's close by. And actually, it sparked another um, person gave me another website, which I'm going to I'll share it, yeah. um, where there's these scenic gravel road routes in Maryland. And there ain't so nothing it, wrong with that for off road. No. It is off road. Just so. Right. And, and your exactly. family went with you and they probably went with right. you because it was close. Exactly. And I think they would go more often if. You know, there were closer places. But anyway, it was a really nice day out, getting to the wilderness, be in my Jeep, you know, away from the city. So, and I got some really cool videos of my Jeep. Well, see, just like a drug dealer, this is good because you can get them started with the free stuff and then right, get them hooked exactly. on the rocks and uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the trees, the dodging of trees 
and uh, Nate standing in front of your Jeep going, no, 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 your other left. Driver, driver, driver. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm glad that worked out. And uh, Tammy, I know you posted up some pictures uh, out there. I, I know I saw that one uh, that one picture. I, I think I even commented that uh, this would be a great place to take Jeep photos at. Um, uh, where was that? Was it Facebook? And, and uh, well, I actually, where can people see the, the pictures that you put up? Oh, yeah, you can see I posted pictures on Facebook, Google+. I'm slowly starting to post some of them on Instagram. Um, but, yeah, Facebook probably is the best place. Or and, you can go look at the video on my YouTube channel. And, and where, Mama. where else all that is? But uh, Well, I was going to say Twitter is Mama Jeep, but is everything else Jeep yeah. Mama? Yeah, Jeep Mama. M-O-M-M-A. Correct, Amundo. All right, so uh, I went over to uh, uh, an old email from Novak. Josh was uh, telling me how great uh, Novak was for uh, all kinds of transfer case parts and stuff. So mm -hmm. I was definitely going to get my uh, transfer case chain from there. And I'm slowly, I haven't, I haven't purchased it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm 99% sure that I'm doing the 242 fix. But uh, I went over to the old email from Novak and I said, well, I'm going to try to re re reply to this one and see if maybe they have some heavy duty uh, MP242J parts. Um, and because uh, Josh swears that, that that exists and Novak says that we, we have a lot of stuff, just contact us. So I figured give it a shot. Anyway, they contacted me back and said uh, that they don't have any heavy duty MP2, MP242J parts. But they'd be happy to build me an, a heavy-duty NP-231. <laughs> so I said, sure, you know, give me a quote on that. Uh, and I'm kind of hoping that it would be uh, a cheaper price than what I was looking, uh, looking at over at J, JB Conversions. So I don't know. Maybe I'll go. Maybe I'll fix the 242 one more time. Maybe I'll go with the 231. I guess really the only downside to the 231 other than uh, losing the uh, the full time four wheel drive, is I've got to buy a plate uh, for the uh, for the shifter because uh, it it's the different notches for the two thirty one, and seems like there's something else. Oh, the little plate, the little bezel that uh, yeah. you know has the stuff on there, and uh, you know you think that's not such a big deal. Uh, I'm not a big junkyard person. Never had uh, very much luck. Usually don't have the right tools uh, when I, I get there for what I'm trying to do. It's just an experience thing, I'm sure. Uh, but so I looked on eBay and do you know those parts are, are pretty damned expensive, like 25, 30 bucks for each one. Like the bezel is like, uh, you know, 30 bucks and the little plate that you put on there is about 30 bucks. So good Lord, you got to wind up spending 50, 60 bucks just to, uh, put a, the 231 in there on top mm -hmm. of buying the 231. These things that we do with our Jeeps. I know we're crazy. And I got my uh, my flashers working properly on my uh, my Jeep. I'm really excited about that. Josh, you'll be proud of me. I've started using my signals. Oh, I am. <laughs> you don't use your signals when you turn? No, absolutely not. Holy, especially why? Ex especially in traffic. Well, you don't want to give away your strategy because if they know, oh, Lord. If, oh, you, Lord. if they know you're coming in that lane, they're going to speed up. If you just Oh, they are not. I'm act yeah, though they do. This is <laughs> this is Houston, baby. <laughs> they do that. So if if you're cruising along, you just you just kind of gotta not act. You know, don't don't get over there close to that that lane. You just stay like you're going, and then you zip over right before they can speed up, and then you're you're in. So yeah. Anyway, now that was a funny thing that a guy said one time on a repeater. <clears throat> he says he doesn't use signals because he doesn't want to give away a strategy. And if you if you leave, live in a big area like Boston or Houston or uh, I'm sure California like Los Angeles and stuff is probably the same way. Uh, it's very difficult to get around on the highways. So, yeah, uh -huh. you use anything you can. I, I will say this, though. Uh, I did use my signals anytime there was a, uh, a police officer within sight. Oh, well, yeah, you better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, guys, let's get into what uh, we'll wheel some wheel and where. We're going to talk about some events coming up in your neck of the woods and around the nation. Now, it's pretty much, well... If it is basically the biggest, if not one of the biggest events, Jeep events on the planet. I am, of course, talking about the annual Easter Jeep Safari. This year is going to be the 52nd annual Easter Jeep Safari. That's a big one, guys. March 24th through the April 1st, through April 1st. It's a week-long oh, event, guys. Um, and uh, pretty much, if you don't know about this, you've been living under a rock, perhaps. Uh, go check it out, guys. It, all the information is over at the the Jeep Club's uh, hosting uh, site. It's uh, Red Rock Four Wheelers. 
uh, is who puts this on. And they've got a great site and all the information you could possibly digest about what this is. It's in Moab, Utah. Head over to rr4w.com to find out all of the event details. Hey, did you guys uh, see that uh, that email from Andy Newell uh, inviting us out to Easter Jeep yes, Safari? I, yes, I want to go. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> Josh depressed. is closest, so I am. I'm close. It's still like, a 16 hour <laughs> drive or something. It's, it's oh, yeah. it'd be a good break in test for your motor, Josh. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <You know>? sure. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for that invitation, Andy. I would love to go. That would just be a blast. Oh, we'd all love to go, yeah. but uh, maybe next year. Maybe next year. Well, uh, next month, anyways, uh, April 7th, uh, is the Ruby Trucks and Route 1 6 presenting the Uari UOHV Jamboree 2018, guys. This is going to be a really cool event. Huge swap meet, club convention. They got a kids' area. Check this out helicopter rides. What off-road event have you ever been to where there's helicopter rides? <laughs> Pretty cool. They've got a huge vendor expo, the whole nine, uh, happening April 7th. Gates open 9 a.m. at the Uwari OHV Park in Troy, North Carolina. For more information on this, well, head over to uwarijamboree.com. We'll have the link for that on uh, the, the show notes for this episode as well. Now, this is an event that, uh, that I'm going to be showcasing for a little while because, well, one, um, it's a regular happening thing. It's not just a one-and-done type of thing. Um, this is going to be a monthly event that's happening every, every month between March and October, um, and it's Jeep Night at Boardwalk Billy's on Sardis Road North in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, the first Monday of every month, first Monday of the month, Jeepers from all over come together to see and show off their amazing rigs. Guys, the pictures I've seen online of this event are way cool. Got to go check it out. Uh, you can learn about upgrades, talk to shops, talk to other Jeepers, uh, talk to clubs, Facebook groups. You can plan rides, other events. Best of all, they do all of this while raising money for children in need that are local to the area. 10% of all of their food, sa food sales during the event will be given to the families in need, and 100% of the proceeds they raise from their monthly raffle, which is huge and awesome for what I understand, is all given to the families with children in need. Please join the community the first Monday of each month from March through October and support this good cause. We'll, of course, have the link to the Facebook page where this event is being detailed at. You can get all the information and find out how to support them. Two things, guys. If you go to this event, uh, we would love, if, love it if you would share some pictures with us so we can put it up on our, our page and our social media. And uh, the other thing is make sure that you let the, the folks out there know that you're there because the Jeep Talk Show told you. Hey, and if you know of an off-road event coming up, well, shoot us an email with some details. Have you been to a Jeep event recently? Well, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to our contact page at jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. Hey, folks, and don't forget to go over to my blog at www.jeepmama.com, and you can follow me on all my great Jeep journeys. And, of course, if you need a voice for your product or your business, check out my professional voiceover services at thevoiceofjosh.com. That's it for this week, guys. Until next week, be sure to follow, friend, like, subscribe, and above all else, be sure to tell a friend about the one and only Jeep Talk Show. So no matter where you're wheeling, if you pack it in, pack it out, and don't wheel where you're not supposed to. Remember to always tread lightly. If you'd like to learn more about the Tread Lightly principles, head over to www.treadlightly.org. Warning, the Jeep Talk Show is produced on a closed course and done by professional drivers. Do not try this at home. Casting since 2010. Ended with the music fading out. I mean, that's like having two orgasms at the same time. It never happens. <laughs> oh, jeez, Louise. <laughs>